Hey there, beautiful and intelligent readers and writers. My name is Sarah, the um, marketing and outreach dude at the Midwest Writing Center. I always try to find a good word for that and fail every single time. I am so happy to welcome you to another edition of Write More Light. Today, um, I sort of scrapped my intentions uh, Sunday night because um, I had a beautiful and sad conversation with a friend <clears throat> um, who I recommend you look into. His name is Aram Pachian. He is an Armenian novelist and short story writer. Um, he he and I were speaking over um, a chat and he was trying to explain to me what he's going through, but English is not his first language. And um, there's a, a war and um, I think war maybe even be a generous term going on in, in Armenia right now. And he was trying to explain to me, you know, his, his mother's sick and COVID is happening and he's waiting for for the military to call him to duty because um they have they have draftability there. Uh and he <clears throat> he said, I am like Ash, who speaks but Ash. And while uh using the word like makes it a simile. He he then said, who speaks but Ash? And he was trying to describe depression to me. <clears throat> he ended up using that word. And I thought that is the most perfect description I have ever heard of, of depression. And it's been, it was spiraling and spiraling and spiraling in my head since Sunday um, and through yesterday. And I scrapped my plans for today and rewrote them. For, for metaphor, I'm so in love with with describing oneself as ash for when one is depressed, and I'm going to talk about why. And then we're going to talk about other things like bad metaphors and uh, how to make good metaphors. I don't think metaphors are exclusive to poetry. That's something that really, really... Um, messed me up for a long time. I feel like in seventh grade somebody was like, poems use metaphor. And then my brain said, everything else is straightforward, which is nonsense, uh, especially given that I don't even think like that. Maybe I did when I was 12. But, okay. So first I'm going to dive into I am like Ash, who speaks but Ash, uh, and why that is an excellent way to describe depression. I think obviously there are millions of ways to describe depression with metaphors and everyone has, every musician, every writer has, has dealt with talking about depression in some way or at least um, a big weight and, and darkness surrounding the big sad. And this is kind of the opposite image, right? Uh, which is what excites me so much. First, I see... Um, ZZ Packer, I want to say in the actual story, Drinking Coffee Elsewhere, but definitely in that anthology, she is describing speaking with someone whose cigarette turns to a cylinder, a pillar of ash. And that has stuck with me for 10 years. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that has nothing to do with depression as ash but it is the first time i saw ash as this as as what it is right we've all seen fire and seen things turn to ash and it is soft and it is um dead it is not necessarily still right but uh there's there's no animation to it which i think is part of what excited me other than the the visual of a cigarette made of ash is that something that was once alive is now dead. We don't get ash without fire. I'm sure that there are variations on that truth, but something has to happen to turn the physical into ash, which is part of why I think this is a most amazing metaphor. You, you once were and now are not. Um, and maybe, maybe not, you are not, but there's no returning to that previous state from Ash. And there's, 
nothing left of that previous state, right? At a certain point, all things turn to ash, regardless of what their original state was. And there's so much to dig into there, and I'm, I'm going to try to keep it short today. I um, am in a little bit of pain from a muscle spasm, just presumably why my posture is so weird. <laughs> um, but I, I encourage you to dig really deep into why why ash is such a beautiful way to describe depression. Look at me grinning about it. That's weird. <laughs> but that, that, that first bit that I said, um, you know, all things turn to ash if they don't melt. <laughs> and it is, it has so little to do with the original state and there's no going back into the original state. And then beyond that, it is a lifeless state. There's no, it's soft. It's, it's not even pliable. You touch it and it's different and it doesn't go back to how it was even in, a, in its original ash state. There's no, um, hardiness to it. And what a, the things we normally think of with depression are, I already said, you know, a weight, a darkness, um, a heaviness even, but this idea, which I think is, is very real that you are so light and so nothing that a breath, right? Not even wind, but a, a breath could shatter the structure. Any movement could shatter the structure and, and it is all nothing. That's so heavy and so apt. I know, um, I know we talk a lot about as, as artists, you know, that, that we, we get depressed and I don't think that that's at all necessary. I think that that's a very dangerous stereotype. This idea that artists are, are solitary and depressed people. First of all, like don't be solitary. It's not good for your art. <laughs> um, I'll stand by that. I will die on that hill. Being solitary does not help your art. It may hinder it a great deal, but also, you know, if it's something that so many of us experience, if it is something that informs our art, it's something that we should try to understand. Um, that might be a hot take, but I stand by it. And, and part of interrogating that is looking at how, how we've described it before and maybe more accurate ways to describe it, or at the very least different ways to describe it. And I think that we don't discredit our own assumptions about depression enough. I, I don't intend to call, you know, darkness and weight cliche. I think that cliche is sort of an insult and there are plenty of things that are cliche because they're accurate. Um, and I think that those are really accurate ways to describe depression a lot of the time. But I think there are multiple ways and multiple layers to depression, right? So, you know, maybe my body literally feels too heavy to move. That is definitely a heaviness. But you get to this this place, and this is, I'm, I'm digging into the ash metaphor again. You get to this place where it it doesn't even matter the weight anymore because you barely exist. I mean, that is, I, I'm obviously going on and on about it. It's been eight minutes now <laughs> because it is so powerful to me. And then his follow-up line, who speaks but Ash? I don't even know what to do with that. Um, as if there's so little identity left that, that what speaks for me is, is dirt, right? In, um, in Christianity. There's the, the phrase on surrounding death and, and or birth, um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, um, from, from dust you come and from dust you will return. So that adds to, and he's got to be Christian, whether or not he was thinking of this when he said it, isn't really relevant. Armenia is a Christian nation. <laughs> um, but that's another layer of it, right? When we when we read and when we write, we are in conversation with all literature that came before us. And 
as such, you know, the Bible is, is part of that. All religious texts are, you know, if you haven't read it, then probably you're not in direct conversation with that piece. But also, you know, um, that's kind of like saying that we don't all know that there's some, some rife history to using an apple. Um, I, I took an English class around the time that Twilight was really big. And part of it was talking about like, what does, there's just beautiful graphic art on the cover of um, the Twilight books. And, you know, one of them, I think, <laughs> Now, now I'm looking back, I don't remember if this is true, um, but we did talk about it, you know, like, what does it mean that there's an apple on the cover of this book? And, you know, maybe uh, the author didn't intend that, maybe the, I mean, the author doesn't, doesn't do the cover design, uh, which is fantastic to think about now in my head. Um, but anytime you use an apple, you have to understand that if someone's doing a close read of that, they're going to be thinking about the great history of apples in, in, in art. And what does that mean? So, um, while my friend is truly, we were in a conversation, he wasn't writing, um, described himself, his depression as being ash, his himself, he turned to ash, his identity, his body is ash. Um, <clears throat> and then he says, who speaks but ash? You know, you have to consider if this were writing, which it wasn't, um, you know, from, from ash, from dirt, I'm clearly a Bible scholar, uh, you were born and, and from dirt you will return. You know, this is a, uh, in this depression you almost cease to exist, right? And, which is, is great with the ash thing, I already talked about, like, <clears throat> fire destroys the, the integrity, the identity of a thing that turns to ash, but it also then can, can relate on this biblical level, that's amazing. Um, and that's what we need to do when we're, I mean, we don't need to always, always just write what comes out the first draft. But when you go back, when you're in editing and you're like, mm, this metaphor doesn't really work, examine it, interrogate it and, and figure out like, where has this been used before, right? If you have an apple in a scene and you're like, mm, I really just wanted them to be eating fruit, then, you know, maybe it's uh, grapes. Don't, don't make me examine where grapes come from. But there's obviously also just huge varieties of writing out there. And some, some don't need to be interrogated. Some of them we write and read for escapism. And some of them um, are not in conversation with, I really didn't mean to say the grapes of wrath. <laughs> um... <laughs> But sometimes just a little, putting a little weight on that makes all the difference. Even in, you know, your short essay, even in your short poem, even in something that you're not going to share. I know, um, I don't, I, I don't know now what the exact phrase was, but several years, like eight years after I wrote, completed and published a piece, a friend who I use as an editor, um, she went to editor school. I'm very lucky to have that friend. Uh, a friend was looking at the piece and she said, I want to work on this one line. And we ended up giving it a new metaphor, throwing a metaphor in, adjusting a metaphor, I don't remember, that that had a wordplay to it. And I, it knocked my socks off. I've never written something that impressed me. <laughs> um, so I think it's very, very important, even if it's just for yourself to examine to examine your word choice. And so from that, I had a professor, I'm gonna um, take leave of the beautiful ash metaphor and go into cliche. I had a professor uh, at college, obviously, where else would I have a professor, who spent a class period talking about, I don't know if this was like her pet uh, metaphor or if this is one that's really used a lot in the world, um, but she spent a really long time talking about the metaphor, your love is a red, red rose. And being me, that drove me nuts. Um, and I started thinking like, what's a better metaphor for love? Like, how can we, how can we talk about love in a way that's more apt? And I, I just threw other nouns into the place of red, red rose. Uh, I think, I think using red twice does a lot of work there. And I, 
I'm not going to go into that, but I think it's very interesting to say red, red rose. Um, red has its own whole history, right? Has its own definition and meaning and, and conversation when using it twice. Rose is its own powerful metaphor. You know, roses die. Roses have thorns. Um, do you pick it? Are you leaving it in the wild? You know, wild roses are, are gnarly. <laughs> uh, totally different from, from the ones that we, um, garden, and I'm not a gardener, um, the ones that we tend to and take care of and then pick and sell in stores. Um, so I know that her point was like, what does it mean if your love is a red, red rose? Um, but in my head, I went to, what if your love is a cockroach? Like, why can't I kill it? Why won't it leave me alone? <laughs> um, what if your love is a book with no spine? What if your love is corn? <laughs> Um, I love corn. Now that I said it, I was actually thinking of tea. I have tea sitting next to me and I was like, mm, not a plant, not a drink. I don't like that. Um, but corn, right? In in our 21st century world, probably much of the 20th century, we use corn to make plastic and we use corn as filler. And also we use corn to eat. It's a food. Um, but then, you know, you can have your break, just like pure corn. You can have popcorn. We use corn to make fuel. Just, I just chose a random plant off the top of my head and it is rife with possibility. Um, so I encourage you to just replace the noun with another noun and see what happens. Um, and also to, to interrogate why something may be cliche. The red, red rose thing, truly, I haven't researched it since that class. Um, but I hate it. <laughs> and I don't know if I hate it because it's cliche. I don't know if it's cliche. Um, Roses certainly are everywhere in love stories. Um, probably I hate it because my teacher loved it so much. But uh, it's tired, right? There's there's a difference between a, an accurate cliche, an accurate thing that is used a lot, and a tired one. And I know for me, I am for sure drawn to the tired ones because they come easily in my head. I, I'm sitting and I'm writing and I'm like, ah, yes. It is like a rose. Let's keep moving. Or, um, and he gives her a rose. And then I keep moving, right? Roses are flowers that people are given. Roses in our world, in the real world, are a romantic symbol. Flowers in general are, but roses especially. And, and we give them that power in the real world, and therefore they have that power in our writing. But maybe this character is not someone who can afford roses or maybe this character is not um someone who likes roses um you know i i know that the colors of roses have different meanings too um i know that if i'm using rose as a metaphor which is my whole intention here um that's different from someone just giving a rose to a person but all the same the the nouns we use have that same weight if not if we let them they have that same weight in in narrative in verse on first blush what we're writing is what comes to us and that's how it should be we should not turn our brains on so much in in the first writing process but upon return it's very important to look at the word choices that we use particularly in non-action sequences. Um, and I'm going to keep on with it. I'm going to keep on with the, the stinking rose because it's so obvious, right? Um, there are a million situations in which flowers show up and love is, romance is an obvious one. So just someone's got a bouquet on the table. This is something... Um, Apple. I brought up Apple before. This is something I played with a lot as an experiment myself to see, you know, if I have a bowl of fruit on a table, it's either a bowl of fruit or I talk about what the fruit is. And then if I hypothetically am doing a close read on this piece in which on, and let's say it's <clears throat> a four page short story, but a detail that is given, right? There's, there's brevity to short pieces. And so when you do give details, those details are important. So if this is a bowl of apples, 
versus a bowl of fruit um, versus a bowl of a variety of fruit. That's a whole different meaning because the words we use have this history. So it is absolutely always, always, always worth investigating, not investigating, interrogating our word choice, particularly with nouns. Nouns are where metaphors live. I um, am never... It is rare to see a metaphor that says, um, I'm going to use uh, my friend's phrasing. I am like Ash, who speaks but Ash, and say an, an, uh, a, a verb doesn't, doesn't work so much there. I am a jog. I suppose jog is a noun verb. Shout out to... Uh, Dear Lindsay O'Brien, former um, Young Emerging Writer Assistant Director, taught me the game of noun verbs, and I'm obsessed with it still 15 years later. Thank you. <laughs> um, point being, verbs are not where the work is done in metaphors. Um, I am struggling to think of verbs now. Um, Everything I'm thinking of is also a noun. I was going to say breathe, but then I am a breath totally works, but not I am a breathe. Um, run. Run as a noun works, like run in your pantyhose. Run as in I go for a run, not I am the action of running. Um, nouns, nouns are, nouns do a lot more heavy lifting than we give them credit for. I think we, we work a lot on adjectives, we work a lot on adverbs, we work a lot on verbs because so much of what we're trying to do is action, um, but there's so much heavy lifting in those nouns and I don't mean I'm describing a room and there's a desk in the room, that's not where the work lies, um, but what's sitting on the desk is going to do a lot of heavy lifting not just in the metaphors that I'm super excited about today, but in telling me about the character who who has this room, what um, what's on the desk tells me a lot about the person who works there. Um, and if I'm looking into it, because this is my my close read project of the month or in college or whatever. Um, if there is a rose on the desk, that's totally different from there being a daisy on the desk, from there being a hydrangea, from there being... I was honestly trying to think of a plant that wasn't a flower and failed. <laughs> um, I almost said fern, and that's a ridiculous thing to have on a desk. But the point remains, someone who has um, a bamboo plant in their office is different from someone who was given a bouquet of roses. And... Um, what if those are dead flowers? Or dead bamboo can... I've never seen dead bamboo. That sounds really sad. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> so that's that's my favorite point here. Examine the nouns that you use because one way or another they are doing the action of a metaphor even if you're just describing your surroundings. They do a lot of work to inform whether or not that's figurative in your intention. They're doing a lot of figurative work. Um, even in prose, tons and tons and tons of legwork is done in in the nouns that that are just used for setting. Um, part of this, I am already going longer than I expected. I really love this, this topic. <laughs> um, part of this, I think the most important part, I know when I'm writing, I a lot of the time like I'm just writing. I've got my writing mode on and I'll hit a point and I'll be like, um, and I will literally grab into the air trying to find a word. Um, and that's a great space to just leave a spot or use a crappy word and like circle it because you want to come back to it. Um, but what's really important there for me is paying attention to my feelings, <laughs> the real, the real emotional feelings and the real tactile feelings. Also, totally use all of your senses. Um, 
but stuff that, that comes to me a lot, a word I like to use a lot of the time is creamy, which is almost never the right word. Um, but it's a word that I feel like also describes like soft blankets, which makes no sense. Um, but that is what happens in my brain. <laughs> um, so it's really important to, when you're not necessarily writing, to, to sit in your moments and think about what the, what the feeling is emotionally or physically, uh, which, which goes along with the, the seed journal stuff that we talked about with my bath mat. How, how to describe this, this feeling right now. Um, emotionally, it's harder, you know? Um, most of us don't, I don't know if this is true, maybe some of us do, sit in a, a depression and think, what am I like right now? Am I like Ash? Or am I like a puddle, you know? Um, but it is good, you know, after you have a really good experience or a really bad experience or a really nothing experience to sit, you know, when you're going to bed and you have your your tiny notebook on your nightstand. And you're like, you know, today was a nothing day, but how did I feel? Um, that's something that's really important to pay attention to before that feeling is lost and take notes on it. And that can work in your seed journal. Um, obviously I think the pocket size is really convenient for when you don't expect to be having big feels or you don't expect to come across something you might. I think we've all woken up in the middle of the night or been falling asleep and thought of something really great and not written it down and then wondered forever what that thing was. I guess we have cell phones. Cell phones can work just fine. Um, for taking notes. So that's my biggest and best advice. Pay attention to your feelings and, uh, and play around with nouns. But in, in that moment, when when you have some quiet after you had a whole day, in stopping and investigating, maybe add this to a, a bedtime to-do list. I don't, do you have a bedtime to-do list? I have a bedtime routine. Um, and thinking about what I felt today and ways to describe that feeling uh, can do a lot of work for you later especially, you know, the act of writing it down. Maybe you don't look at it again for six months, but you remember it better because you stopped and focused on it. Also, totally look at those lists in the morning or, or later. If you write some stuff down at night, look at it in the morning. That will definitely help it stay there and it'll help you, you know, spend your, your, the time when your brain isn't doing so much work. You know, you're making dinner and you're doing it by rote or autopilot. But you've got those words mulling, mulling through your head. Um, the last bit of advice I'm going to throw at you is... <clears throat> Sorry, I just saw your comment, Sherry. I love this. <laughs> I love this so much. Um, did a reading at Roz Talks with Ash Wednesday ash on my forehead. I, I love this so much. Um, I obviously, obviously I've been thinking about Ash Wednesday as I talk about Ash and um, never did another one on a Wednesday night. That is such a bummer. I, I want now to do an Ash Wednesday reading where it's either one Ash Wednesday or um, specific to uh, the topic of Ashes to Ashes, Dust to Dust, right? Um, no, I'm going back. The last piece of advice I'm going to give, I'm going to give about this is the dictionary is your friend. I have, um, this shelf behind me is on craft, reference books, or things I'm currently reading. Um, it's a weird way to hold my hand. Um, and so behind me I have so many reference books on craft, but I have a handful of books that work as dictionaries. Um, I have a dictionary of synonyms and it's not a thesaurus. I also have a thesaurus, presumably. Um, this is really the place to um, it's a dictionary. It puts words in order that are synonyms or antonyms or close to being synonyms, things that have similar meanings, and then defines them. And it also goes into etymology, which a good dictionary will do, but most are limited by pages. So etymology is 
often left out. I obviously have a dictionary and a thesaurus. Um, I've got a rhyming dictionary, which is um, not great on its own. I think when you're using a rhyming dictionary, it's really good to have a dictionary on hand too. Of course, you can use your internet search engine and look up words. Um, but something that I really love about using an actual physical dictionary is getting lost in the words. You know, I go to look up the word impair and um, along the way, if I can remember where the I goes. Okay, here we go. Impair, by the way, was a word I saw when I was flipping through this. It's not like written on the wall behind the computer um, or a word that I care a ton about. Um, so I go to impair, which is on the same page as immodest and impecuniness, which is not a word I've ever heard before. Um, so I'm distracted now, and I go to um, here impecunious, having little or no me. That makes sense. Um, and that's part of the fun of it. You know, the word after impair is impala, um, and the word before it is impacted. Like that's. There's a lot to get lost in, and that's one of the reasons I love a physical dictionary. Because you never know how that's going to come in handy if you love words. Um, another thing I have... Where is it? Okay, here. Um, this is a... And you've heard me say a million times, I don't see myself as a poet. I am taking a poetry class right now, and I took another one earlier this year. Um, poetry, I think, is where I gain my most education from reading poetry. It's where I get most of my education on how to write. Um, but I'm, I don't have a tendency to write poetry or feel comfortable doing it. That said, The Making of a Poem, this is a book that um, Ryan has also recommended, which made me feel good about it. I got it in... A college class but it goes into you know how how these different parts the different pieces the anatomy of a poem um, so there's gonna be a lot in there of course about metaphor um, but also how structure how wordplay how um, meter can do heavy lifting for your piece and that does not have to be poetry obviously I hope this goes without saying, but I I have the utmost respect and love and um, I love poetry. I think that it is maybe the best form that exists and maybe part of that is because I don't feel like I can write it. Um, but that's also, I think, something that we focus on a lot as a writing community is poetry and I don't want folks to feel like other writing is less worthy or less highbrow. Um, I volunteer now that I am not highbrow. Um, I love poetry and I love, um, you know, the, the really great classics that do all of the, all of the, the fancy stuff. I do love highbrow work, but you know, when I started reading, when I started loving reading, it was escapism. And when I started writing, it was escapism. I, I read and wrote so much fantasy as a kid because I didn't want to be in the real world. And that doesn't make it less worthy writing and it doesn't make it less highbrow. We love what we love and that's good enough. I'm so, so off topic. I just, I get so, so excited. Um, thank you for bearing with me for that. Um, yeah, use your, use your resources. Uh, I, as someone who studied English, as someone who works in literature, have a lot of books on craft and have a lot of books on words. Um, maybe someday I'll just sit on this bookshelf behind me. You can see, you can see how many of them are. This is the, um, the, the Webster covers here, right? Um, and while I don't think that we all need to sit and and read these books on craft. Um, it's definitely helpful, even if it just sits in the back of your mind. It'll it'll come into play later. So um, 
with my big beautiful rant on metaphor I would like today's prompt and I'll set that timer and I'll let you go after the prompt um, I would like you to write on the phrase and I'll throw this in the comments um, I am like ash who speaks the ash I'm gonna put quotes around it and give credit to Aram He has uh, two books in English. One is called Robinson, it's short stories, and the other is called Goodbye Bird. Um, that's a metaphor I didn't understand. In Armenian, the word bird is used uh, to describe someone who's always working, um, somewhere between a busybody and a workaholic. Um, he's an excellent, excellent writer. Um, Armenia is kind of going through like a modernist phase right now, so expect modernism in there. So, putting five minutes on the clock for the prompt, which I will write into as well. I, I am like Ash, who speaks but Ash. Five minutes. I'm also going to, um, forgive me, I'm going to read the comments and reply to that. But um, if you're checking out now, have a great day, write more light, and leave your questions, comments, and concerns. Got about two minutes left on the timer. Um, I started this late, of course, because uh, I did some talking and some commenting, but I'm really enjoying where this is going for me.
my timer went off silently. Um, sorry about that. Um, I've I've told y'all before, if you've um, been with me before for the free write, that what I tend to do, and um, it's accidental, I just I feel so much pressure <laughs> from writing to a prompt, that what I tend to do is journal on the prompt. And I didn't quite do that so much as I went into varying interpretations and, and definitions of existing as Ash, which is, you know, how I spent the first 10 minutes of this video. And there was still so much more to unpack from it, and it was so heartbreaking for me writing into that. Um, but I hope you all came up with something. Um, maybe, um, maybe something more literary than what I did, um, but I love it so much. I'm, I'm still just so enamored with this, and I've spent a few days thinking about it. So, um, thank you again for being here. Um, I hope that you had as much an awakening by this metaphor um, that I did. Uh, please let us know in the in the comments or in messages <laughs> what uh, lessons you might need, what resources you might want. Um, I'm here. Ryan's here. Uh, we want to we want to give you all of the the literary and writing resources that we can. You know. Um, we're here for teachers, we're here for writers, we're here for readers. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to have the uh, inimitable Misty Urban on. We're going to talk about some exciting new stuff with, that the Midwest Writing Center is doing. I don't know if you've seen my posts lately, um, but we've got... I had a stretch, sorry. <laughs> um, we have, this is the official first announcement, um, a publication coming out. We're calling it the Disaster Anthology, which is a bit of a misnomer, but we want you to write about 2020, submit it to us. We want to print it. Um, very excited about that. Misty and I will be talking about that in detail on Thursday, but we've also got the chapbook, con not contest, the chapbook series, the um, Foster Stall chapbook series. Submit your manuscripts to that. And um, we, we plan to publish annually, and we plan to publish all the good stuff we get. So, no, not all of it. We don't have unlimited resources, but it's not limited to just one book. Um, we also have our annual holiday open house. We're still doing it. We're going to do it at home. It's going to be virtual, um, but we've got care packages ready to go for, um, for those of you who are SVP. So hit us up. Questions, comments, concerns, exciting things. Um, I want to give a shout out to Sherry and Penny for these amazing comments today. Um, I am I'm so in love with that. Um, this is um, one final shout out to dictionaries. Uh, I, if you are associated with the university, you probably have access to the Oxford English Dictionary online, um, which will give you just a full amazing etymology of really anything. And Penny in the comments contributed some great um, background information on on ash in the church. So um, I'm going to leave you now. I hope that you um, write more light into your life. See you Thursday.